Jeff, what have you, Jeff, what have you been doing? Is this where you've been going all afternoon, all week? This is why you've been coming back with that stuff on your hands, isn't it? Jeff, this is amazing. What, what's that around their heads? Hat, is it a hat? Why have they got that around their eyes, Jeff? What's that supposed to be, Jeff? Hi, you're with Scott. It's uh, Battery Exhausted, my channel. It's Ganji Kid, my stream. It's midnight, it's always midnight. This is your right ear and your left ear. We're here today for an hour or so in the daytime to talk about some more prehistoric art, really. We got, uh, got some interesting things thrown up at us yesterday when we were looking at prehistoric art. And one of them was this concept that really early, really early timeline, 16,000 BC, paintings found in shallow caves in Arnhem Land in Northern Australia of kangaroos, fish, and supernatural beings employ the so-called X-ray style in which internal organs and bones are depicted these images are among the earliest and most distinctive forms of Aboriginal art and continue to be produced today. So I thought that was really interesting. I just thought, what is going on? And we're going to cover all of the art in art history. You know, we're going to cover all that. But I wanted to take a few sidetracks here and there. And this is going to be one of them, isn't it? Because what is going on with these supernatural forms? Apparently I don't have access to this article so I can't read this but Australia and New Guinea formed a single landmass and the prehistoric continent of Sahul until 8,000 years ago the rising sea level separated them at the Torres Strait this continent was first occupied at least 40,000 years ago by people who arrived by boat from Southeast Asia so that's these original peoples that are traveling into there Southeast Asia boats 40,000 years ago. Uh, we've got some Aboriginal prehistoric art to look at. So I, I found this. Uh, I'm not really sure about this website and its validity. <laughs> but it brought up something that's interesting. The Lost World of the Bradshaws. I don't know what Guan Guan means. The Bradshaw paintings are incredibly sophisticated, yet they're not recent creations. They originate from an unknown past period, which some suggest could have been 50,000 years ago. And yesterday, I don't know if you remember, but we looked at a picture. Uh, there was these images of Aboriginal prehistoric art. And I saw a picture and I was like, this one doesn't, it looks too modern. And maybe it's a fake. It was one of these style. strange images and it turns out they are the Bradshaw rock paintings and they definitely depict sort of humanoid forms don't they but there's a kind of strange there's a lot of strange things going on there's a kind of strange head shape or hat is that hair that's been tied back there's definitely adornment to these figures and there's some stuff going on isn't there you know there's some stuff going on supernatural is, 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 a, is a descriptive word that has been levied you can see why they've been described as uh, supernatural <laughs> kind of is just bizarre isn't it it's, what are they are they images a folklore or are they depictions of a people there's definitely something humanoid about them isn't there you can definitely see the eyes and the, the nose sort of thing but they're almost skull skull like so interesting isn't it and this is you know 50,000 years old so we don't have like much to go on <laughs> maybe we'll find out more maybe they will turn out to be um, traditional interpretations of these maybe they were just somebody you know messing about maybe they're just you know doing some designs but quite interesting isn't it the repeated image of these I mean they appear to be some kind of 
of like are they glowing have they got fur on them is that supposed to be hair something going on around the eyes are they things they're wearing on their faces or are they the actual faces that's aboriginal hey chat hey chat i just just noticed we've got the chat popping off popping off in chat i can't find the window oh, i've lost my chat window <laughs> I'm going to order a new monitor, you know. I'm going to order a new monitor, like a second monitor. There's my chat. Nice to have you here again. Nice to have you here. And check out uh, the Onyx Gamer on YouTube. Review videos. He could put his own link in the chat, I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm getting confused now because I'm trying to talk about prehistoric things. Look, about 35,000 years ago, and this is good because this will come up one day and you'll be like, boom, got this information right in my brain. Don't know how I remember that, but I do. This is my favourite website at the moment the uh, visualartscork.com. Australian Aboriginal rock art may be the oldest Stone Age art on the planet. The possibility is supported by the studies of Professor Stephen Oppenheimer, Stephen Oppenheimer, I've heard of him, whose research combines genetic analysis with climatology, archaeology, fossil analysis and modern dating methods. In any event, human occupation in Australia has been carbon dated to at least 53,000 BC. Fair enough. We keep finding out that it's old. You know, that's cool. That's cool. Ceremonial figure from the late Tassel Bradshaw style, Kimberley, Western Australia. Bradshaw is now called Gwian art, are amongst the most sophisticated forms of cave painting in Australia. So that's come up again, the Bradshaws. The x-ray drawings come up again, so I'd like to see some x-ray drawings. So we've got Bradshaws and x-ray drawings, dating, human chronology, Sydney rock engravings collections. So I'm looking for and this, okay, I'm going to get Google out for once because Google's broken. I was going to do a video about this, but I'm saying it now. <laughs> Google is broken, yeah? You want to answer some specific question, you type it into Google. That's the whole point. Oh, bucking, bucking, bucking doggy. Just switching up to the big face. Yeah, you know, do you know what? I, I don't use this computer for looking at anything naughty. It's just that it might come up with my bank details or something idiotic like that. And a noob streamer like me might ruin their life by accident. So I've asked Google specifically for what I want. And it may be that it tells me the meaning of these Aboriginal paintings. But what's more likely is that it's got these other suggestions, right? Now, this is how Google works, isn't it? It's going to push you the most popular thing. And it might not be the answer to what you want. Like the other day, I wanted to know the efficacy of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine after a week. We'll just do this quickly because I'm going to fade my face. Oxford vaccine. Little detour now, a little mental detour because this is how my brain works. So I wanted to know the efficacy of the Oxford vaccine after one week, right? But because Google has got absolutely loads of these articles that are being pushed up the search option thing um, that don't offer me the answer. This one here, I did click, what's the evidence for extending? And it's about 70% protection after the first dose, 12 week boost interval. It's always talking about intervals between the vaccines. It offers 100% protection after a first dose with an interdose interval of 12 weeks. And these words, these keywords, weak, vaccine, Oxford efficacy, they're all coming up. So Google's bringing me these correct things, but they're not answering my question. It's telling me 22 days after the vaccination, 90 days after the vaccination. That's not what I wanna know. I wanna know one specific piece of data, the efficacy of the Oxford vaccine after one week. And what it brings me is a million websites that don't answer the question directly, that all feature the keywords. Most of these are you know, the top searched AstraZeneca, British Medical Journal. Great, they're great. And through those websites, I was able to find out my answer through my own research by finding the actual data from the Oxford AstraZeneca trials and interpreting it myself. And it turned out that there was no data for a week. They didn't start recording the efficacy of the vaccine after the first week. They started after 10, 12 days. So there's no data for it. So that the answer is, we don't know what the efficacy is after, a first, after one week of one dose. But you can't have that as an answer for your Google. You know, Google's supposed to be the best search engine in the, in the world, isn't it? It's supposed to be this oracle that answers your questions. You can't have your question answered unless it's the most popular question. 
you know, the most searched for question that's going to be pumped up the, the search engine. So that annoys me about Google now. It used to be a lot more specific. It used to give you uh, a lot more variety in the content that it was suggesting, but it's homogenized that a lot. It doesn't want to suggest, you know, it's got 11,000 results here. So I suppose I could be wading through more of them, you know, but it doesn't want to suggest all the crap to you. And, and there's so much crap as well, because look, now we're here, 10 pages down or whatever, seven pages down, you've got crap like the sun, just reprinting other people's data that you can find elsewhere or just garbage. Um, Time, The Atlantic, you know, all these news media, they just, you know, something gets published, they just republish it and it becomes a page on their website as well, which goes on this huge list of 100 million pages, all just garbage, all saying the same thing. None of them answering the question that I want to answer. So the meaning of Aboriginal Bradshaw paintings, are we going to find out the meaning? We've got creative spirits, uh, Australia for everyone, some conversations about these Bradshaw paintings. So we'll have a look. Here's one, Bradshaw rock paintings meaning. So this does help, you know, it does help me Google finally, but it's not come up at the top, has it? It's not the top answer to my question, even though that is my, my question. <laughs> I'm going to stop moaning about Google now. I'm going to stop moaning about Google. I mean, I'm using it. I shouldn't be using it. Oh, my God, look. <laughs> look at that. Not only was I using Google, I was using Firefox. And it turns out I'm the, I'm the lucky... I am the lucky winner. Don't... This is not a scam. Do not adjust your set. Right? This, this cannot be a scam, could it? Because, of course, companies like Firefox... Like companies like Firefox want to put out a prize. Like why why are Firefox awarding prizes for, for number of searches? Right? Here's five billion somebody else won a Samsung. <laughs> I could choose my prize, look. They're hidden. So it's exciting. These are the recent winners. Look, Richard there. That's a picture of Richard, apparently. <laughs> Oh, I so part of me really, really wants to click on this. Part of me really wants to click on it, just because it's content, isn't it? It's interesting. We'll find out what happens when. Not only did I mention online just a few moments ago about not wanting to display my public details, like my bank details or my automatic login or whatever, um, I can now be scammed for real, <laughs> live. <laughs> There's that Kit Boga channel. He's really good. Kit Boga. He uh, he's clever on the old computer, so he can set up a fake computer on his desktop and do the scams and not not damage himself and actually scam the scammers. So that's quite cool. I don't know if you've ever seen Kit Boga, but you need, we need Kit Boga on this because uh, I'm not gonna. I've not made the five billionth search. I mean, maybe it heard me. Maybe you know Google heard me complaining. And wants to reward me. <laughs> That's a shame. We didn't get the answers about Aboriginal art and we didn't win our prize. But we didn't lose everything out of my PayPal account. So that's good. You know, all four bucks. <laughs> right. That was Google for us. Google did Google tried to rip us off, didn't it? Smelly old Google. So we're going to Ecosia and we're asking Ecosia. Five hundred and fifteen trees I've planted. We're going to look for the Bradshaw rock paintings through the prism of Ecosia. We're getting nowhere, are we? We're getting nowhere. I thought this would just be a little add-on to yesterday's art history. We just have a little look at the the Aboriginal paintings. That's what I thought. I thought we'd just have a little look at these Aboriginal rock paintings that would bring up a website that would give us some theories, some like you know interesting ideas. We'd learn something about ancient Aboriginal culture. You know, something that explained some of the symbology. There's, uh, I'm going to have to bring up, go back. This, my brain is just, you know, this is a daytime stream, isn't it? Where I've got no, no, uh, <laughs> nothing holding and limiting my brain to one, dire one directional path. So um, I just want to show you Gobeki Tepe for a minute and then talk about concepts and ideas. <laughs> go, I can't even spell it, but Gobeki. Tepi. 
right? So there's this place, Gobeki Tepe, and there's a man on the internet who reckons that this is proof, proof, it's evidence, proof. His name's Graham something, Joe Rogan had him on. Joe, I believe anything anyone tells me and therefore I'll present it to you. Like it could be credible evidence on the internet uh, and it, millions of uh, of suggestible people will listen to it and try and disseminate what's factual from what's absolute nonsense <laughs> from this complete spectrum of uh, thinkers and ideas, booksellers, booksellers. Right? So he's had this guy on and this guy's like, yeah, go back to Tepe. It's probably, uh, probably aliens. You know, for, somehow I've managed to find the, um, some kind of foreign language. I mean, I think this is Spanish. It could be Portuguese. Uh, so, Gobeki Tepe, io topo di uma colina onde foi encontrado um santuro no ponto mais alto de um encantamento montanoso que forma, que forma a porça, it might be Italian, a forma a porça ao mais a sudestre de Montes Toro, a aproximadamente 15 kilometers, a nordeste, yeah, nordeste, I think this is Italian, no, to the north of um, somewhere in Turkey. And what it is, is it's ancient rocks. They're carved out, discovered, you know, done the old Indiana Jones archaeology on this. They've dug them up and they've found them and they're old. But, and here's the, here's the but, right? These rocks are not just just normal rocks. When you, when you have a look through them with the modern technology, they've not got things in them that normal rocks have, like tiny imperfections, fossils, um, random bits of other like material. Uh, it's almost as if these rocks are like formed in some way and some of them are so big it's a bit like um a bit like i'm gonna get another picture because i'm sure we'll get another picture of this uh a bit like stonehenge or something like people are like oh i can't this can't be explained it can't be explained that humans back then could not have done this right there's one they've got some heads there's also a lot of um, imagery uh, involved of these dudes with the heads, with the beards and the hats. They're around a lot. And there's these, the, you see them up in the background of this picture. The idea is that they're smooth and they fit together a bit like Tetris pieces. <laughs> Tetra, tetraminos, that's what you call a Tetris piece, a tetramino. A bit like Tetris pieces, they fit together. And so it's impossible. You can't carve these and then fit them together. You, like humans cannot have done this. And this guy then goes on to make this mad leap that he's like, this Graham fella, he's like, okay, so this is beyond my understanding of, of um, rock sculpture. Yeah, I'm not an expert on rock sculpture. Me, Scott, is not an expert on rock sculpture, but nor is Graham, right? Graham's interested in like history and old stuff. So he can't explain this through his limited knowledge. <laughs> yeah, so he's like, right, the next step is aliens. Like, it's definitely aliens. Like, these headed hatty men with the beards, they're the aliens. They've come down. They've got alien technology. They've done all this stuff. And they've just disappeared off into the sunset and not really left any substantial evidence of alien technology other than a few smooth rocks that fit together. And it's rubbish. It's absolutely rubbish. It's so rubbish, like it's so out there that it, it manages to be sensational enough to sell a few books. And that if you don't follow on with the thinking and get to the end of the thought process, that you might buy into the books and you know then they do your thinking for you. The ideas are solved by Graham and his ideas. Uh, but it's absolutely rubbish. Joe Rogan presents it on the internet. Graham gets notoriety. He goes on some tours, you know, and talks about, his, you know, he's promoting himself and his books. So he gets himself onto something like Joe Rogan who promotes it further. And it's just this wheel of um, capitalist, uh, it's, it's a, a function of capitalist society that it's a wheel of, I don't want to say trade because there's no real trade going on. Um, it's an economy 
function. You know, this guy sells books. He needs promoting. The people who promote things need people on their shows because it gets them views, which gets AdSense money, which clicks, which, you know, it's all about just selling stuff through a process of promotion, cross promotion. Uh, so, so this guy has promoted his ideas. It's wrong. Yeah, it's wrong. It's bullshit. It turns out, it absolutely turns out that back then they knew that acids uh, and alkalines could affect the structure of things like rocks. They knew that you could dissolve things like limestone in sulfuric acid and reconstitute it. You know, and again, I'm not an expert on stone sculpture and chemical reaction, uh, but I do know that you can produce those rocks in the forms and styles and ways they have through a process of chemical reaction. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be aliens and it doesn't have to be unobtainable to these ancient peoples. It's natural, you know, in the same way as rain corrodes rock. You know, it's just a natural phenomenon and natural observable phenomenons can be understood even by ancient peoples. So that's what happened, right? The Gobeki Tepe, I've answered that for you, for anyone who's ever watched out of my five viewers or anyone who watches this on Battery Exhausted on, on the YouTube interweb. Um, I've solved the Gobeki Tepe for you there and we can go into further detail. I can search YouTube and learn about rock and you know, stuff like that. But I'm not going to, if you really want to, if you want to do any further investigation, it's out there for you. And there is evidence that this happened in these sites. There's evidence of uh, limestone and other rocks being dissolved by chemicals deliberately. There's evidence of it, right? So uh, it's answered, we've solved it. It's not aliens. It's absolutely not aliens. This is bringing this back to what we were talking about with these Australian pictures is I was hoping that through the use of something like Google an information resource so I was hoping we'd get some sort of you know actual historical interpretation so let's keep pushing for that going back to the one that I like so Paleolithic scholars continue to debate the meaning of these early prehistoric pictographs probably they had a variety of meanings which varied from region to region the term Erudite Epoch was used by Dr. Walsh to embrace two art periods. Yay! Oh, I love it. We're getting to finally go. This is our first art period, really, isn't it? The prehistoric is our first. And now we've discovered about the Erudite Epoch. It's a term used by Dr. Walsh to embrace two art periods. One, the Bradshaw period. Oh, the Bradshaws get their own period as well. Divided into tassel figures, sash figures, and elegant action figures. And number two, the clothes peg figure period. <laughs> oh, it's just, it's, it's so well into that first period, the erudite epoch, two art periods, the Bradshaw periods, that's the main one, isn't it? They've got the sash figures, the action figures, and then this other period a bit after, the, basically, they wanted to bin that one off. They called it the clothes peg, the clothes peg figure period. It tells you about it, doesn't it? it? Tells you about it. But uh, it's not so glamorous, the clothes peg figure period. It's believed that distinctive apparel changes indicates the artistic change accompanied a, uh, indicate that the artistic change accompanied a significant and widespread cultural change. Right, got you. So what they're saying is that the changes in the art styles is significant. I don't know if I'm interested. You have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is good because I've no idea what I'm talking about. I'm also learning. I wanted to know all about the art. It's absent in my brain. You know, there's a, a, I should know where all the art came from. I've, I've come capable. In the future, supercomputers are going to know all this stuff, aren't they? And people like me reading it out on the internet are going to be old school. <laughs> AI is going to be able to just know this. It's going to get confused. Because if artificial intelligence were to read everything on the internet, it would be well confused because it's going to give it different different ideas, isn't it? But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just got confused myself then. So let's get it back on. <laughs> we're learning. This is fun, isn't it? Learning's fun. Just like finding out stuff. 
And what will happen is that this you won't see it as learning. This won't feel like school. But later on in life, you'll just be watching quiz show or something will come up and you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, they remind me of the clothes peg figure period, the second part of the erudite epoch where those tassel figures, sash figures and elegant action figures were being painted by ancient Aborigines in the Bradshaw period. Hopefully we'll find out some of these things have shorter words attached to them as well that I can say. So yeah, they reckon though that it changed, like culture changed. And during the change in culture, there was a change in rock art. Fair enough. Aboriginal artists showed a clear preference for a certain kind of rock surface. Ah, oh, I see now even more learning. This this website, this Cork Arts, Cork as in Ireland, the place. Cork, I might want to go there. I'd love to go there. Um, they really know their stuff and they're really, you know, just telling it like it is freely on the internet. Clear preference for a certain kind of rock surface, namely a vertical rock face made of hard, smooth rock. So they were all about their their medium, their canvas, their, you know, they weren't just, oh, no, that rock's all right, but it's got a bit of a bump. You know, they were looking for the right rocks to paint on. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because knowing how people create art these days, how you approach that, you know, a nice piece of paper, a nice blank canvas. That was the same way these artists were supposedly approaching their works some 15, 20,000 years ago. And uh, that also tells us that maybe the, the work, you know, we've got these cave paintings and we always assume that these people live in a cave and they've painted all the walls and they're sat there around their campfire telling their stories about how today I nearly got eaten by a dinosaur. <laughs> it's no dinosaurs. Big old bumpy hoppers, but no dinosaurs. So they're telling their stories to each other and some chuffers over there just scuffing it up on the, oh, did you? All right, okay, let me, a, a big jumper hopper? Okay, I've got the big ears. Yeah, got the big ears on. Maybe, you know, someone's chuffing it on the wall or something. But it might not be that. There might have been some some fella, some lady, some person of non-specific gender has wandered out into the the rocky wilderness to find a really good rock for their thing they've got going on in their idea, in their brain. And then they thought, this is the right one. It's got, I can put the figures there, I can put the shapes there and We'll just start with this. They've, you know, they've approached it in a, a very similar way to an artist may approach something in today's day and age. And then, of course, once they're finished, they've probably gone back to the tribe and said, look, come with me. Come with me. And they said, what, what are we going to go and do? They said, I'm not telling you. Right? I'm not. This isn't about, this isn't about telling each other things. The old big face got me on the old big face. This isn't about telling each other. You know, what we're getting. This is about showing, showing. This is a pictorial culture. So come on, it is about telling each other things, isn't it? We've got our old um, stories they hand down and things like that. Anyway, look, come with me, come with me. We're, we're having a look. What are, you, what are we looking at? I don't want to come out with you around here. It's all just boring rocks. Ah, oh, is it though? Is it though? Are they all just boring? Because round this one, whoa, Jeff, what have you, Jeff, what have you been doing? Is this where you've been going all afternoon, all week? This is why you've been coming back with that stuff on your hands, isn't it, Jeff? This is amazing. What, what's that around their heads? Hat, is it a hat? Why have they got that around their eyes, Jeff? What's that supposed to be, Jeff? <laughs> But that was what was going on. That's what was going on during the erudite epoch. They were painting on these particular rocks. Only on this kind of canvas could they demonstrate the exceptional line work, control, and in intricate detail that characterizes the typical Bradshaw composition. So it was needed. They needed these smooth rocks because they were doing uh, delicate work. In addition, the focus switched from pictures of animals or occasionally solitary naked humans to pictures of elaborately dressed human figures portrayed in groups. The 
more um, evocative images that make us think maybe aliens. For the best examples of our Aboriginal finger fluting, <laughs> please see Kunalda Cave Art. Right. Let's see it. The only shame of this website is their images are so small and their adverts are so dominant. But this is some finger fluting in the soft limestone walls. The long lost art of a vanished civilization. Just looks like kind of prim primitive stick people, doesn't it? Rock art. That's finger fluting then, scratching into rock. It's almost like a graffito, isn't it? I think that's what, what hang on, I think that's what graffiti means, isn't it? Scratching into rock. Graffito. So now we've got to find out some other things. We've got to find out graffiti. Graffito. Graffito is the singular form of the Italian graffiti, meaning little scratch. There you go, scratches. So that rock fluting really is early graffiti. Graffito. And then the other thing I wanted to find was these X-ray Aboriginal figures rock art. I wanted to do some of this. I wanted to have a look at these because we talked about them earlier and we just briefly ran by it. But maybe this is going to have to be a different kettle of fish because look at these. Look at them. I mean, that is not an x-ray for a start. I know they suggest that it it is. And you can see this sort of rudimentary bones, maybe a, a rib cage. But no, 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 that's not x-rays. That's not how my bones are in my legs. That's not how my bones are in my, my spine. And I mean, it really roughly is. Really roughly it is. But no, it's not. I mean, there's something about it, isn't there? Like, there's some kind of mechanical... Uh, you know, you can see there's joints where they put these markers to say, like, joints. They know there's a difference between the arms, the hands, the fingers, the segments of spine, the rib bones. They appear to be correct. But then there's this crisscrossing of the muscles in the legs. And it's a really, you know, really, there's no, um, there's no pelvis, no pelvic bones there. The skull is just what's going on there. It's, it's really bizarrely simplified in some places. I mean, is this, again, I, I always find myself coming back to this question of, is this somebody's, um, is this somebody's, what do you call it, uh, like style? Is this somebody's graffiti style? You know, is this just one person in the tribe is well into their, bone style shapes and, and they're the one that's doing the drawing or is this something more important shifting cultures changed the way they were painting maybe that suggests maybe the shifting cultures changing the form of art suggests that it's more uh, stylistic Aboriginal x-ray painting again. This one is more more clearly an x-ray. And it's very... St wow. Okay, so what's insane about this one is that it's more like an x-ray that you would recognise, but they would never have the technology, even if they could cut an animal open and see what's inside it, they wouldn't have the technology to visualise that as a cross-section in the same way as we do with an x-ray. And we take it for granted when we see a cross-section of the human body or an animal body on the x-ray that you you know you know where these organs are and, and where they're supposed to be. And so you're like, oh, that must be the thing and that must be the this. And it's just shapes on the x-ray, but you're like, in your brain, you're like, that's the, the lungs or whatever. Um, but this appears to be, you know, they've got the the bits connecting in the right places Strange shapes in places as well, but, you know, really interesting, isn't it? And it's got 
a spine all the way from neck to tail. There's a lot of information in there that seems to be quite sophisticated. On that giant buffer hopper. Very similar. Gone for the spine again. They're interested in that spine, aren't they? The nerves. Okay, we're going to go diversion again, and I'm going to just divert to something else now. And this is our lesson. <laughs> we've done this. We have done what I wanted to today, which is we've looked at the Aboriginal rock art. We've learned more about it. We've tried to understand it more as little as we can, and we've decided that it's probably not uh, aliens that it probably is early humans and their ideas that have produced these images. So that's good. We're happy with that. We can learn about Dr. Graham Walsh as well, who during the 1980s and 90s studied the region and the pictures, crisscrossed Australia, taking thousands of photos, meticulously compiling research, released two seminal books, Australia's Greatest Rock Art in 1988, and Bradshaw's Ancient Rock Paintings, 1994. Unfortunately, he was over-influenced by the apparent cultural uniqueness. As a result, he refused to believe Bradshaw's were created by ancestors. <laughs> Here we go again. Do you see what I mean? Oh, my days. So this guy, who Dr. Graham Walsh, who in the 80s and 90s, that's not so long ago, you know, that's recent times where they've got photographs and uh, televisions. He's going around Australia. He's recording all of these rock art. You know, he's seeing them all firsthand. He's getting really good photographs of them. He's sitting down, he's thinking about them. He's writing books, compiling books, which are probably just picture books, to be fair, you know, with a bit of chat thrown in. Um, I'm, I'm not slate, you know, maybe he did, maybe he did write really interesting, long, uh, narratives <laughs> sadly because the style emerged fully formed as if imported from abroad and because it bore little resemblance to the Wan Ninja tradition that followed so because they're kind of interesting and unique he refused to believe that they were created by ancestors of present day Aboriginal people <laughs> So you find you find rock art in a cave on the rocks, you know, in Australia. You date it with your modern techniques. You know it's old, really old, right? Really old. And I'm talking like original people old. Like the first people moved into Australia, 40,000 BC on rudimentary boats from South Asia. And we're talking... Polynesian tribal, you know, old, old, yeah? They painted these things on the walls and they're quite good. They're not like the, the paintings of, of other cultures, maybe. They're not, they're in their own style. And the cultures that follow the as we said, there was a, a, an explosion in art across Australia and a cultural, not just explosion, but like um, change, evolution, revolution, you know, things were quickly changing culturally and that's reflected in the art. So because of that, uh, <laughs> you're like, you know what, these can't possibly have been painted by these original people that were the only people that were here. Like, they were the only people there. There was no one else there. What do you think it was? Aliens. Is it aliens now again? Is it we're going back to aliens? Is that what we're saying? <laughs> uh, I mentioned dark matter. I'm into science. Yeah, I, you know, thinking, science, interesting stuff, isn't it? Good. And since it talks about our brain, you may, you may certainly put a poem in the chat. The chat is yours to, uh, to share. Yes, certainly. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, 
the one will contain the other with ease. And you, beside. The brain is deeper than the sea. For hold them, blue to blue, the one the other will absorb, as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God. For heft them, pound for pound, and they will differ, if they do, a syllable from sound. It's quite interesting. Isn't it nice that uh, thoughts about uh, science and thoughts about thinking and the way we think and the um, infrastructure of our thoughts, like the, the, the physical squashy stuff, uh, yield such um, evocative and romantic language that is so spectrally removed from the concepts of science and you know isn't it amazing how science and these sort of strict logistical uh, disciplines exist to understand something like nature which in itself is so evocative and beautiful and mysterious and isn't that isn't that like that's that's okay mind blown again <sighs> clip this one uh, it's just that we use such analytical and um dry and clinical devices to attempt to describe something which in its simplest form provokes and invokes such emotional responses. And there's no science to, I mean, even though there is definitely a science to neuropsychology, and, you know, someone will one day find out the exact scientific, you know, formula, basis, background for our emotional responses. Yeah. But to us, they're still going to feel like emotions. They're not going to feel like uh, switches. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if that's how artificial intelligence will view the world through its mechanically structured you know through its mechanism I wonder if it will create something more beautiful than the uh, the mundane that's used to create it I wonder what whether the thoughts of artificial intelligence will be romantic and poetic I wonder whether the thoughts of artificial intelligence will become romantic and poetic because our thoughts are and they're in response to the world around us and it is science, it is nature, it is physics, it is, you know, all these things, isn't it? When we look into it and dig into it and learn about it, it becomes... Uh, <laughs> it literally becomes lines of code, you know, in, in some ways, doesn't it? And yet those lines of code can produce the experiences, you know, our fears, our joys, you know, everything in between are created through me the squashy mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, that's mental. Mental. Physically, literally, I wasn't saying it's mad, I'm saying that's... Anyway. Um, so <laughs> Australian art was not even uh, accepted by the man who went out to Australia to discover it and 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 tell us all and wrote the books. The, the, the guy who wrote the book thought it wasn't possible that they produced it. Well, I think it was possible they produced it. I think it was. During the erudite epoch. There we go. We've got Bradshaws. Different kinds of Bradshaws. So I think... Having talked now for an hour and a half about this, I think this is a good point to leave it on hiatus. It's given us a lot to think about. And our next diversion stream can be about these Bradshaws. We can have more of a look into the Bradshaws. Because there's not a lot of images here. Maybe I should collect a few images up. So we can look at them. Because looking at pictures is the good bit, isn't it? Oh, I see, look here, look, that's a Bradshaw on the left, and that's a one 
Gina on the right. I can see why they're quite different. I can see they're quite different. And I can see why someone would have said, look, these aren't the same people who are doing this. But then again, you know, look at how graffiti has changed in a short space of time. Look how art itself is so different in so many cultures. It's so easy to vary your ideas artistically. But yeah, so we'll come on to that next. Next art stream. We'll have a look at those figures. Maybe even paint some ourselves. Although I would need a really large flat bit of rock or there's loads of flat bits of rock, there's buildings. Do you know what? I would love to be a graffiti artist, but I really wouldn't want the police to be turning up at my house and saying things like, did you do this? <laughs> Can you come with us? <laughs> so uh, that's why I've abstained from graffiti. But this is already starting to make me feel like I should be reinterpreting the Bradshaws and using the large flat planes of rock buildings as the... I Should I say this? No, I shouldn't say that. Maybe don't do that. Maybe don't do that. But it's there, isn't it, as inspiration for people. I'd have to move to Australia to really make it work, wouldn't I? Oh, look, here's some questions as well. Look, could that be a rudder 16,000 years before rudders were believed to be invented? Could they be keels? If so, how is flatwood attached? Probably aliens, isn't it? <laughs> this is written by Graham Walsh. Is that the same dude that I was talking about? 404, not found. That's just final. Our final thing is just let's see who this Graham... Graham, and then go Becky Tepe. Is he the right? Is he the same guy? Graham Hancock. So it's not the same guy. Graham Hancock. Graham Hancock, magicians of the gods, is the one who thinks that magic and aliens produced simple, reformed rock structures that we know ancient cultures can make with limestone and acids. <laughs> He's the one that talks rubbish on Joe Rogan. So don't worry about him. Graham Hancock and yeah what I need to do now is I need to get some lunch I think yeah no I don't want the police at my house yeah <laughs> definitely don't yeah they, they, they think they can do what they like don't they they think they own the place <laughs> yeah so thank you very much for being here I really appreciate it I endeavour to edit these streams to a more uh, consumable format on Battery Exhausted, but not everything will get edited for that. The entire stream will be dumped on Ganji Kid on YouTube as an archive, and uh, we will continue on flying. Shall I just quickly switch to Big Face so we can fly like Superman? Sorry, chat, you're getting disappeared as well. That's Big Face, that's disappeared. The chat. Fly like you can't. Uh, fade between the two right now finally we can fly like superman into the future like super people into the future and that's what's going to happen on this stream more art history because unlike everyone else on twitch <laughs> i honestly believe that we can make art history popular through a combination of uh, in interesting exploration like we're doing and uh, regular update upload yeah, I think we can do that. I think we can get that that happening. Uh, I'm glad you've been with us, uh, both Onyx Gamer and Saint Just Germany. Um, I think it's really important that in these early stages your voice is heard, and uh, I thank you for engaging and giving us something to talk about together. So yeah, I thank you for that. So be good, my little Pukos. Be good. My tummy rumbled then. Quick, it's time to go and get some cake. <laughs>